us for the Don't Buy a Bomb documentary launch. This is a monumental moment for us. As I was saying to a few of you who arrived earlier, this film has been in the works for over a year now and we're so, so excited to be bringing it to you and really hope that you can be involved in helping us to spread it as far and wide as possible. This documentary is exposing British judicial corruption and follows Campaign Against Arms Trade's monumental trial against the UK government for illegal arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Of course, the launch comes at a colossal moment in history where we are witnessing a global scale collapse of legislation claimed to protect people from war crimes, genocide and oppression. This week it has been revealed that Chair of Foreign Affairs Select Committee Alicia Kearns said a Tory, at a Tory fundraiser that legal advice would mean the UK has to cease all arms to Israel without delay. And that coming into the news this week is really, really important for the way that this documentary can contribute to that narrative. Not to do so, so for the UK government not to stop arms sales to Israel at this point is putting the UK in breach of international law again, and they would be seen to be aiding and abetting war crimes by a country it was exporting arms to. This comes way too late for Palestine and far, far, far too late for Yemen. Since the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen began in 2015, at least 154,000 Yemeni citizens have been killed as a result of military action, with British-made weaponry playing a central role. International humanitarian law does not permit assaults on non-combatants, and the UK government must be held accountable to their complicity in these war crimes. And this is what Campaign Against Arms Trade and Mawatana set out to do on this incredible journey, this incredible court case against the UK government, holding them account to their own laws and international law. But while there is these structures in our law and international law, the government is not sticking to them. And you will see in this film that the current judicial precedent puts the arms industry above civilian security. This film is not only an anchor in the failing civil and judicial contracts, but also a beacon of hope, a demonstration that when civilians and NGOs around the world come together, they can take hold of the narrative that currently binds us all into military violence that causes catastrophic generational harm. This story of judicial corruption should be used to further the agenda of halting arms sales to human rights abusers, most urgently Saudi Arabia and Israel. This is a David and Goliath story, and that must reach the masses so we can continue to demonstrate that we will not turn a blind eye to their warmongering and they will not make us feel powerless because together we are Goliath holding truth in the left hand and love in the right, we walk towards a world beyond war. And it is with great pleasure that we will be watching the film here together for the first time ever, and then turn to our amazing panelists. We have Katie from Campaign Against Arms Trade, Amina, a Yemeni scouse artist and activist, and the film director, Eva McQuaid, who will be bringing all their lessons and passions for this incredible film to you and we'll have the space to answer any questions you may have. So please use the chat box. Um, when a question comes to you during the film, just put it straight in the chat um, and we will come to it at the end along with our thank yous for the many other people who tirelessly worked on this project. So without further ado, let's play the film. Cindy, please. Breaking news from the UK where a court has ruled that the government broke the law by allowing arms exports to Saudi Arabia that might have been used in Yemen's war. Since the start of the war in 2015, Britain has licensed the sale of around $6 billion in arms to Saudi Arabia 
three senior judges concluded that the weapons contributed to civilian casualties in indiscriminate bombings. I think someday this might be seen in the UK as a scandal of the same scale as the Iraq invasion. We hear hospitals being sacked, schools, wedding gatherings, agriculture. As a British woman, I say to our government, why do we have British made bombings on the ground? Um, Hi, oh. hi, oh. hi, everyone. Can you still hear the sound? Sorry, let me just organize this. Katie, could you unmute my screen share? breaking news from the UK where a court has ruled that the government broke the law by allowing arms exports to Saudi Arabia that might have been used in Yemen's war. Since the start of the war in 2015, Britain has licensed the sale of around $6 billion in arms to Saudi Arabia. Three senior judges concluded that the weapons contributed to civilian casualties in indiscriminate bombings. I think someday this might be seen in the UK as a scandal of the same scale as the Iraq invasion. We hear hospitals being sacked, schools, wedding gatherings, agriculture. As a British woman, I say to our government, why do we have British made bombings on the ground? Um, Cindy, the sound has gone again. That's for a campaign against arms trade. Um, um. Okay. Um, Hang on. Sorry, everyone. We're just figuring this out. Maybe, Katie, you need to unmute your... Oh. Let me play it now. We're a reasonably old organization. I think we're 40 or 50 years old in 2024. Our database is actually one of the only places you can get like immediate, quick, accurate information on what the UK exports in terms of its arms. Saudi Arabia has been the UK's biggest customer for arms exports for a long time, and especially throughout the, the war in Yemen. So that's nearly eight years long at this point, depending on the exact year or month, it could be like 40 to 
of UK arms exports go to Saudi Arabia. So like half, basically. There was a really specific reason why that first court case happened, and it was that there was outcry from the UN, from international NGOs, from NGOs in Yemen on the ground, that there were kind of mass civilian casualties that pointed to either violations of international humanitarian law or potentially war crimes. We were well positioned, I think, to, to give the case a go. Here they were setting off, so excited, so full of life. This footage was filmed by a boy called Osama, showing his school friends on their rare day out. A plane from the US-backed Saudi-led coalition struck a bus carrying them. Dozens died. Some of the bodies were so mutilated, identification became impossible. The first substantive hearing in 2017, we presented volumes and volumes of um, reports and evidence about these alleged violations in Yemen. Um, and this included, for example, reports by organizations such as Medicine Sans Frontier. In at least one of those reports, they had mentioned that there was a cross on the roof of the facility, and yet they had still been hit by a coalition airstrike. Ultimately, MSF withdrew, I think, all or most of their operations from Yemen um, because they kept getting hit and it was too dangerous. The High Court first found that British arms sales to Saudi Arabia were lawful, which was an extraordinary decision given the criteria according to which Britain is allowed to export arms because these arms sales to Saudi Arabia clearly violate a number of those criteria, including the likelihood of civilians being harmed specifically by those weapons. In the first case, CAP put forward all of their grounds of challenge, all of our grounds of challenge, about why the decision was unlawful and why the process that, had, that the Secretary of State had gone through wasn't sufficient. And unfortunately, um, the judges in the divisional court the first time around didn't agree with any of those arguments. And so the claim was dismissed on all grounds. In June 2019, I was outside the Royal Court of Justice. And I remember that excitement when it was announced that the selling arms to Saudi has become unlawful. The impact of that first Court of Appeal ruling was huge. I think everyone is aware, like not just us, that we're working in a really difficult system. Like there's still legally such high thresholds that you have to cross to get that type of decision. Well, we certainly welcome the judgment, but it should never have taken a four year legal process brought on by campaigners to make the government follow its own arms export controls. Because in that time, tens of thousands of people have been killed in the, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. And the UK made weapons have played a central role in that crisis. The UK made fighter jets and the UK made bombs have had a devastating impact on Yemen. This is probably the biggest judicial review case that I've ever worked on. But it is a really important case because the decisions that government are taking are being made in the name of UK citizens. And it's important that citizens have a mechanism by which they can challenge those decisions if they think that they've been made improperly or you know, the process was, was flawed. Late yesterday, the government admitted misleading parliament on six different occasions, telling MPs they'd assessed Saudi conduct when they hadn't telling Parliament the Saudis weren't breaking international humanitarian law when they didn't know, and they still don't. The main concern the judges in the Court of Appeal had with the case was the government's failure to address any historic pattern of breaches of international humanitarian law by the Saudi coalition. 
the Court of Appeal judges felt that that was a question that really needed to be faced, and it wasn't clear from the evidence that the government had done so. I remember one of the judges comparing it to an insurance application and saying if you're trying to assess whether somebody is high risk uh, enough to not be granted insurance, you obviously have to look back at their past behaviour and work that out in order to assess the future risk. And they specifically said in the Court of Appeal case that the reason you have to do this backward looking assessment is to test the value of the assurances that you're getting from Saudi Arabia when they say, oh, I'm really sorry about that. We won't do it again. If you're not actually checking whether they are, are doing it again, then how are you going to test the value of those assurances? The government says it will challenge the ruling and freeze issuing any new arms export licenses to Saudi while it considers the decision. We disagree with the judgment and will seek permission to appeal. Alongside this, we are carefully considering the implications of the judgment for decision making. Firstly, that they found in our favour at all is amazing um, and shows the strength of what we're what we're saying. It's not just a political argument, it's that like on every level the government has made mistakes. Um, and secondly, it actually did stop arms export licenses for months, even within like our European partners, and they've done different challenges to actually get like arms export license halted is incredibly difficult. Um, so it was, I think, really inspiring for, for everyone in the in this kind of space working on these types of issues that actually, like, even if you think your chances of winning are small, you have to give it a go because it could work and it's the right thing to do. The government decided under International Trade Secretary Liz Truss at the time, on review, she felt that British arms sales to Saudi Arabia were actually legal and simply continued them. Um, in my opinion, in defiance of the appeal court decision and in defiance of the common criteria that governs any British arms export anywhere in the world. The International Trade Secretary Liz Truss announced that the UK government will resume arms licensing to Saudi Arabia. She said that the review ordered by the court concluded the possible violations of IHL occurred at different times, different circumstances, and for different reasons, and that these are isolated incidents. Motana is a Yemeni uh, human rights NGO. Uh, one of the main things that we are doing uh, is documenting the violations by all parties to the conflict. We consider information as a power. The UK, they are playing a very negative role when it comes to the war in Yemen in many levels. If it is an isolated uh, incident, then it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be that big deal for Yemenis. But thousands of Yemenis have been killed and injured because of these airstrikes. BAE, through the British state, provide significant numbers of advisors to the Saudi Air Force, to the Saudi Defense Force generally, the planes that are involved in most of the airstrikes over Yemen, and a lot of what is called the ordnance that is released from those planes, so the bombs and the missiles um, that rain down on innocent Yemenis. And supposedly, according to an answer to a question in Parliament, has also provided advice to Saudi Arabia on targeting in Yemen, which of course is at the center of this legal dispute, because it is specifically in relation to targeting that the Saudis have been killing so many innocent civilians. The British experts train the Saudis in targeting and crucially, are helping reorder bombs from British stockpiles. <clears throat> Human rights groups are demanding an immediate review of policy. I always think of the of Boris Johnson's signature being on this letter to um, from the Foreign Office when he was Foreign Secretary to the Secretary of State for International Trade saying that he thought just after the attack on the funeral hall in Sana'a in October 2016, which killed well over 100 people and injured hundreds more, um, 
even though that had just happened, he had considered everything and he thought that um, it was a finely balanced decision, but that weapons sales should still continue. And that's what he recommended. The reality is that there is a legal system and a rules-based system that is supposed to be used to decide who Britain can and can't export weapons to. Under the UK's licensing rules, the Secretary of State for International Trade is prohibited from granting weapons licenses where there's a clear risk that the weapons might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. Um, and international humanitarian law is the body of law that protects civilians against unlawful harm in armed conflict. Violations of international humanitarian law can be, for example, the targeting of non-combatants, a failure to um, distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. Um, proportionality is a huge thing in, in international humanitarian laws. So say there might be someone, and I'm going to use like inverted commas, like a legitimate military target in a marketplace. But if you uh, have an airstrike in the middle of a marketplace, you might potentially kill thousands of civilians. So like that's not a proportional attack. The war in Yemen. Workers at a vegetable packing factory in the town of Beit al fakni This is where they wash the vegetables. This is where they were washing the okra. Okra for God's sake. Look, okra. So they can sell it in the markets. They're just workers. Doctors and people who live in the area say they don't know what the intended target was, but it's not uncommon for coalition warplanes to hit civilian targets. Some images too gruesome to show, a child once again among the victims. Muathana well, documented an incident in which a pickup truck was bombed, killing all of the people that were riding in the pickup truck, which included only women and children, including very young children and babies. There was something that made me feel like this truck was in our farm. And as soon as I heard the explosion, my heart fell. I quickly went to the farm. There I found a horrifying scene. And I saw my sisters and sister-in-law and all my brother's children and sister's children dead. None of them were left. The coalition investigated it and found that um, the victims weren't women and children. They were um, Houthi fighters who had weapons on the back of their truck. Um, and this is just another example that we filed, which showed that what the coalition is saying is absolutely the opposite to what Mwathana found. And yet in this case, the judgment shows that whenever there's a contradiction, the government just says, will take the coalition's word for it. The government in this case is essentially looking at the NGO evidence and saying, okay, well, that's one version. And then they're going back to Saudi Arabia and saying, what do you say happened? And then Saudi Arabia says, well, we didn't do it or it wasn't a violation because there was a military target there. And they just accept that as fact. And then they categorize the incident accordingly. Um, and this is absolutely horribly wrong because Moathana is the only party involved in any of this, including the UK government, Saudi Arabia, the international NGOs, the only party that actually went there and talked to people and found out what happened. Just to show you how much is like uh, disappointing and even shame uh, to hear that our information is not credible. There is an incident, for example, happened in Hajjah Rate in 2018. So our, our team, they have traveled from Sana'a to Hajjah the second day. They arrived to the scene of the attack while the blood, uh, the fresh blood still there, the remnants of bodies, not only weapons, are still there. I still remember one of the women, she was like the mother of the groom. Uh, she said our men, they were not carrying weapons, they were only carrying necklaces of uh, jasmine flowers. Here it was like an environment of joy and happiness and music, and suddenly uh, it was like blood and silence and uh, a disaster happened in front of our eyes. We have interviewed many eyewitnesses who describe how awful it was for them to be attacked as uh, innocent people, as civilians, in a wedding. 
uh, in a wedding day. And even we could find the remnants of weapons. It was US made uh, weapons. After we do all of this wo uh, work, just easily from, from your chair, you decide that this is not happening. I handed to me hand by myself our report the, the day of judgment, which is like a, a group of airstrikes with civilians and civilian objects where have been targeted. So we, they do know what's happening in Yemen because Muwatana, other local and international NGOs worked very hard to make it clear that there are violations and war crimes happening in Yemen. What happened with that bus was, was truly awful. And I think it's impossible not to be deeply shocked uh, when, you, when you find out what happened. We want to make sure that our allies uh, are you know, conducting their activities in a way that uh, we can defend to our own publics, um, but also respecting that they are allies. And so uh, we uh, will have these discussions, but very often they will be uh, frank discussions in private rather than uh, megaphone diplomacy. And as a UK, as a government, you you are not supporting having an international investigation. And when it, when a, a local investigation is happening, you say it's not credible. So what what is what uh, what do you want? You don't want your allies to be ac accountable for the crimes they have done. You don't want to be even accountable for selling weapons to parties to the conflict that you know since the beginning of the war that they are committing horrible violations and war crimes. Eighteen in favor, 21 against, and seven abstentions. Draft proposal L11 is therefore rejected. At the UN, there was like a group of eminent experts that have done investigations into like all different kinds of human rights violations in Yemen. So not just with airstrikes, but like disappearances. So that that group did amazing work. But then in 2021, Saudi lobbied the Human Rights Council and ended the resolution that allowed that um, that group to do its work. And so the group was ended. Most of the conflict zones in the in the world, they have such mechanism in Syria, in Sudan, in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Myanmar. But when it comes to Yemen, it is very difficult to have one. The UK has a particular role to play in terms of being a member of the Security Council. Um, it's like pen holder for Yemen um, at the Security Council, which basically means it's supposed to kind of be an advocate for Yemen. Um, and instead of really making like diplomatic efforts to uh, create space for peace negotiations, it's been fueling arms exports. So I guess this is what modern imperialism looks like. If you can't be there, then you know, you're gonna profit in some kind of different way. Before this conflict, like when you go back in history, there was fighting when Yemen was part of uh, the British Empire. And I think it is still that power structure, like we still have power over you. Um, and that's how Yemen people feel. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this vigil uh, where we are remembering the people of Yemen on the eve of the court case that will be taking place tomorrow. In the court, we argue our case based on legal definitions of human rights violations, but in our hearts, we fight for all the people lost and the repercussions of this conflict. Saleh Ahmed Masuk Mari, 16 years old. Saleh Mahut Mazuk Mari, 15 years old. Because justice is important because it's about accountability. And not just the British, but any party that has benefited from the cost of Yemeni lives. I think justice will be served. Yaya Abdul Majid Mohammed, five years old. Tell my Yemen figure. This land has been your battlefield. 
the children had been your soldiers and your prophet is their blood. And now go get them. If we're making the violence possible, then it's our violence too. Let's not talk about the terrible barbaric Saudis and, and what, what we're doing being complicit in it. It's our barbarism as well. I am warned by cherries, gunpowder, iron trap, and the tribesmen hell they forget your mark made in Britain. But go, get me. So we're back here again to try and get justice for the people of Yemen and also for people in the UK whose farm system is causing death and destruction elsewhere. Um, and I think it's a very need to just come back to we want to see the laws in the UK applied. What it points to is a serious flaw in the manner in which the UK makes its decisions to continue exporting weapons to Saudi Arabia. And that is the reliance on Saudi accountability mechanisms. So we're putting arms sales above the lives of Yemeni people, and that's the only reason why I literally you could make to say that the isolated so I just want to say thank you so much finally for coming down today. I'm actually from Oxfam and, and the government officials and the people have told me that the accountability of this case at law has actually saved lives in Yemen. I think we just got an email from the Quakers uh, that they had jointly nominated us and Moashna back in 2021 um, for the Nobel Peace Prize. Because we're working on like a controversial issue, people want to say stuff like, oh, those are kind of crazy, unrealistic campaigners that don't know anything about the real world. It just shows that our work has been taken seriously. So the documentation now is not taken seriously for political reasons, but in the future, I'm sure it's gonna be taken, uh, I mean, seriously. So that's why when, when we in Moatana, we consider ourselves building a human rights memory. If we cannot get accountability for now, at least we don't want to lose our chances to have it in, in the future. I want to see justice, and I also want to see Yemen being rebuilt because the Yemeni people that had no say in this war, no say within any business transaction, no say between any power structures, I really do hope they have a say what that future looks like. You know, as a lawyer on the case, I've read through their decision-making line by line. I really, really think that the process they came up with um, is such that it enables them to never, ever deny a license. Raving on your tax money, shouting from the elite rooftops, just to find why my Yemeni mothers bury their children. Because between the dealer and the buyer is a dictator's best friend, a finger on the trigger, doesn't matter who pulls it. But go, um, go gently. Thank you so much. Um, 
please I would love to hear your reactions and thoughts in the comments um, we're going to open up the panel in a second um, and hear from some of the people you've just seen in that film um, it's really really crazy I've watched it a few times but every time I just get even more insight into how the judicial system really sets up our campaigners to fail yet the campaigners come together to build this map of truth and a beacon of scrutiny that really really is essential to us being able to hold our institutions to account and the fact that campaigning against arms trade and Mawatan actually won and then the government went against it is really fundamental in this story but let's first start by opening the floor up to Katie Fallon who is advocacy manager at campaign against arms trade where she focuses on parliamentary and legal work. She previously worked at the Reporters Without Borders UK and for the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs in London and New York. Katie is an incredible campaigner and as you see was really fundamental um, in the court case, the six year legal battle. Um, unfortunately, none of the lawyers could come, but I would suggest directing any legal questions you have towards Katie. But what we're gonna do first is just hear um, a few minutes of discussion from Katie about her part in this court case and any key lessons. We'll then move on to Eva, the director, and then Amina um, for them to do the same. And then we'll come back to your questions, but please do start putting any questions in the chat as we go. But for now, over to you, Katie. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for for coming and for watching the film and for like taking this story into your heart and your head again today. Um, I yeah, I joined Cat three years ago, so we'd just gotten um permission for this second judicial review. Um, so that's always kind of been one of my kind of entering it at that point um really framed to me what a campaign like this is about because so many different people have worked on it um you know our legal team has spanned i think the fir the first um application went in in 2016 and now we're in 2004 so it's kind of an eight year um legal battle well we've um ended legal work on this case now but you know seven full years through the uk uh court system so many of cats campaigners staff members, journalists, other NGOs um, that you'll have seen just even through through the film and um, the amount of different people that have have put their time and their voice into this. Um, yeah, and it, I think it, for me, it was, I think still is like one of the most, um, like, or it, will, it will always be one of the most important things like all I've ever had the privilege to work on. Um, and I think when when the world does it's really taught me like if the world doesn't want to give um an important story or you know a, a quest for justice space you just have to go out there and take it um most of my work kind of focuses on parliamentary work and um kind of the bridging the legal um and the advocacy together and communicating what's what the kind of the weeds of the legal um bits are and yeah it, i guess there's been a good few times where it's kind of been that feeling of, you know, if we don't, if Kat doesn't, if I don't go into Parliament and try and have a meeting with someone or or be the person to answer a question for a journalist, there, there isn't anyone else, but you're not representing yourself, you're representing the people who've been impacted by this. So that always um, is kind of like what, what motivates me, I suppose. Um, and I think looking back now, I guess it's it's like two two sides of the same, same coin. Um, I still feel really inspired when I see everyone speaking because I know how many people care about this and how angry it makes them but then it, may, it freshly makes me really angry um, when I see it because not just for Yemen now but so many of the the issues and the technicalities and the legal system that we talk about there are having a massive impact in Gaza um, all of the same excuses the government is applying them even um, that's just in the domestic setting here in the UK, but 
uh, like when Radia was talking about the um, the Human Rights Council and the mandate um, for that special procedure and the investigation, you know, there's so many layers um, of accountability that are needed, like domestically, internationally, between two different countries, um, at, like a, at a UN level as well. Um, and when everyone turns a blind eye, it just creates this climate of impunity. And that's kind of what will allow another, whether it be Russia and Ukraine or Israel and Gaza, to think I, I can get away with this, you know, and it, it may, really, even when we were speaking about portion, proportionality, that made me feel quite upset because, you know, I've heard from some, Palest like a Palestinian lawyer that was speaking recently, you know, just take proportionality off the board. It has gone out the window. We can't even have a legal discussion about it. Um, and those, those messages that we were really trying to get through about the rights of civilians, about the impact of war, about how, you know, all parties need to be held accountable. You cannot just pick sides just because you have an ally um, or it will allow this to flourish in other places. It's been like very upsetting to see some of that come true again, be repeated. Um, but it does just make me know how important this work is and that every bit of impact will on every like region or any particular conflict will only help other people in the same position. So, um, you know, if we, if we can have any wins, they will continue to to go to go on. And it's really beautiful to see it all pull together. Um, and thank you Eva, for everything you've done um, and especially the feeling of being part of of like a movement um of campaigners that you know have a vision and they're trying to work towards it so thanks thank you so much katie and i'll be coming back to your comment um once we've heard from the other panelists but thank you and to anyone else that's got any questions please do put them in the chat box um so next up we're going to be hearing from eva McQuaid who is a freelance video director with a first class degree in peace studies from Leeds Beckett University. She's worked with Demilitarized Education for over four years, previously directing the seven myths that sustain the global arms trade series, which you should all check out on our YouTube channel too. After training with OTOXO Productions in Barcelona, she's filmed from a range of campaign groups, including the Conflict and Environment Observatory Stop the Arms Fair, Sisters Uncut, and Campaign Against Arms Trade. She was recently appointed the coordinator of Forces Watch, a partner of DEAD and CAT in the UK peace movement. So as you can see, Eva is really holding strong for all of our organizations and bringing many of our stories and educational needs to the wider public through her beautiful, beautiful storytelling as you've just seen. Um, so Eva, if you can answer the same question, what this film has really meant to you and what you've really learned from it. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Nice. Um, yeah, I, 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 we started making the film quite late in the process of the court case, so as you can see at the end of the film, um, we were videoing outside the court case in January, 2023. And it was just before that, that we um, decided to make the film. So there was a lot of work to be done to research, you know, the years of history that of really, really hard work and dedication that's gone into the case um, by, as Katie was saying, so many people involved. Um, so it was a it was a monumental task, um, and it was an honor to to be asked to to tell this story. Um, I didn't expect to. I haven't watched the film in a while, and I didn't expect to to feel such strong emotions watching it back. And I think um, not only was it an honor and an inspiration to talk to all of the the interviewees in the film and to 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 get an insight into how much work has gone into it but the other side of the film um that it really tries to bring kind of down to earth the real life case studies and the impacts of these arm cells in Yemen and i think we really have to Play, pay tribute to Moatan's unbelievable work on that. 
and I was just um so uh, so touched and so inspired by the bravery and the dedication um involved um on behalf of all of the people involved but especially um Moatana and um I think there was a thing that something that Dervila said was that the government tracked 528 breaches of international humanitarian law but still decided to carry on selling weapons Muatana, like and there is a system that the government goes by in order to consider a violation that you know an NGO might consider a violation for that to fit the government's criteria of a violation is even harder so that's not even anywhere near the amount of um catastrophes that have actually happened in Yemen it's at least double that if not more and I think something that really um shocked me when I was researching the the topic was how much work has gone into not just by Muatana, but there's other organizations like the Yemeni Archive Projects and Bellingcat Investigations and they track every single incident that has happened the time the the location the weaponry that was found the people that were injured and that archive is there for history to to show and as um Raja said at the end of the film if the documentation is not being taken seriously now which um is like being in the hearing in January and seeing how the government's um barrister would just completely disregard this this uh you know uh really um thorough and in-depth work that um people have in some cases risked their lives to to gather this evidence even though now in our so-called courts of justice are not um they're not accepting that evidence as uh you know uh, legitimate I think we can have the hope in the future that that evidence is there and it it serves as an historic archive for us to understand the catastrophe and the the bloodshed that that has happened in Yemen for for the future and that really inspired me that you know that so much work has gone into making sure that that is all documented and those violations are you know accessible um for for the you know for the future um so yeah i think we can be very inspired by the 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 dedication and the work that as katie said everyone who's been involved in this court case and i think hopefully it can from the win this albeit jaded by the um the sort the u-turns or the um the continuation of arm cells, it can hopefully um, inspire other other groups to to exercise their democratic right to challenge the government on other issues as well. So, yeah, I think it it was really inspiring, and yeah, hopefully moving forward, we we will see some um, a greater level of of respect for the. Um, for the hard work that all of the groups involved have put into this because yeah that's that's really what I took away from it so thanks thank you so much Eva next up we have Amina Atik a British Yemeni poet who uses her art as a means of activism a freelance creative working across the cultural and educational sector published poet performance artist practitioner and award-winning community activist anti-racism advisor for Curious Minds, um, Liverpool Everman Playground and Playhouse Theatres. BC Word's first finalist, awarded by Steve Biko Young Achievers, featured in 100 Inspirational Women of Merseyside and Future List 2022 of Northern Women Awards. You saw Amina Atik in the film and the poem that was used throughout was written by her as well. So over to you, Amina, and thank you for your incredible contribution to the film and campaigning. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, 
I've watched that film a few times and definitely today had just another ball of emotions. So thank you so much, Eva, for, for your incredible storytelling and doing it with so compassionately. Um, because to tell that story, you have to have compassion, um, especially when it's just so much political language. The essence of it is people, innocent human beings who have no say politically. So I started um, very young. So I'm a friend of Kat. Um, and, you know, Kat do something quite interesting as well as, you know, the legality of arms trade. They also definitely exposed the arms trade through art. And that's how I got involved. Um, someone who has always been involved in activism and art, this was, you know, something that I definitely have grown and I was mentored uh, because I'd gone into that space really not knowing what the arms trade was, didn't know what, it was, you know, it made me feel like, what what can I do as a Yemeni British young person? Um, and definitely when I was in that space of, because they had this um, zine or exhibition that I was published in called People Not War. Um, and that's when I realised there was a collection and a collective of people that were passionate about the arms trade, but using art to do that. Um, and, and that's how I found my passion in this space, but I also was educated. Um, as for many Yemeni diaspora who live in Britain or across Europe, um, I think we'd already had watched the Arab Spring unfold and then the war in Yemen happened. So definitely for most of us, it was, it was trying to navigate what this means. And what made it even more difficult to Saudi Arabia is, is a, we have family links. I mean, it's so difficult to be in war with your neighbor. <laughs> and I think what made it even more difficult is that when you are then British and you're, ta you're a taxpayer, it's, you start to question, what is my stance here? Like, how can I get involved by not taking sides or, and I think that's what happened within the Yemen community. It kind of split the South and the North. People were pro-Saudi and then, and then people were pro Houthi. And that's a question that you get as a Yemeni now is, are you a northerner or a southerner? And I think the underlying question is, are you an advocate for human life? <laughs> and that should be always the question in every discussion. Um, so I think, you know, I, 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 during that time when I was creating art and understanding the arms trade, um, there was also a lot of advocacy within the Yemeni community. So Labour Friends of Yemen was set up during that time. Um, and I was one of the only women in the Liverpool um, uh, collective. And then after six, seven years, it actually grew. And now we have Labour Friends of Yemen across the UK, in Sheffield, Birmingham. So really what happened is Yemeni voices started to grow within the political spaces. Um, and it's, it's been a fantastic space to be in because me and other Yemeni people who are really passionate about the future of Yemen and rebuilding it, but also what our responsibility is as British Yemeni people and what our say is. I mean, people forget that Britain has a very historic relationship with Yemen. So many Yemeni people who live here are the reason that they migrated to Yemen was because of the British Empire being in the south of Yemen. And my granddad was one of them. He came in 1966, just before the British Empire had left. So, you know, it, it it's very complex. And I think it's that moral and ethical question of why, if, if and, and I think I mentioned this in the film, this idea of people felt powerless because Britain, if you hear the name Britain in Yemen, it was, it's seen as this, power country so people felt intimidated and even till today like people don't realize they have a right to question that but I think it's because of the stance that European powers and that this is you know modern imperialism and I think I remember seeing an image of a child holding um like fragments of like like a like a metal scrap and I had the you know the the stamp barcode and I just thought how just, you know, these children just creating these little toys with them. And I just thought, this is the reality. Like, people have died by the, these, these arms falling on the ground and now you have children playing with these scraps. And this is the innocence of what 
people don't realize the, the how big this is. But I think this is greater than just the war in Yemen. I think this is more about what say do we have politically? And I think the fact that that took so long to even question and to even be taken seriously just shows that these people in power do not represent us. They do not represent the, the voiceless. They do not. And I think this has made me very passionate about youth voice and youth leadership and getting more people from the Yemen community, especially young people involved in policy making. Um, I am an artist, I'm not a policy maker. However, I definitely think art has a role to play here. Um, people forget that art is speaks. We, I can't imagine what 100,000 people look like, but I can definitely imagine what one child looks like with a name and a family and a house. And, and you know, this is what art does. It's, it builds imagery and metaphors and, um, and yeah, so I I think one thing that I definitely learned is that even though the lang political language can be very difficult to understand sometimes and it can be very intimidating, I think these things can be broken down and to be spoken to the majority of our audiences. Um, and I hope that in the future, and I say this, justice will be served. And um, so one thing that I've Grew, grew up as an Arab or as a Yemeni is that you have two living rooms okay two TVs one is showing BBC and one is showing Al Jazeera so as a child of diaspora we have witnessed two different types of images one that is filtered one that is non, not filtered so I think someone of diaspora we have seen the non non-filtered pictures the pictures that are so gruesome and I think it has had a detrimental effect on well-being um, to the point where I don't think people want to talk about it anymore because they don't realise that these things, because of how much they've seen, they don't realise that could, any change will ever happen. Um, the situation in Yemen is obviously, it's in the situation it is because of the consequences of international interference. There are now more than three plus million Yemenis in Egypt. Um, and they are scattered across Europe now. The future of Yemen is going to change because of that mass migration. We have now Yemeni people who are speaking Dutch, German. I mean, every country, there's Yemeni people in Japan, in China. So as well as this having a detrimental effect on people's well-being and, and lives and their family, I think we are going to see a very bright, bright future of Yemeni people who are going to come and get justice. And I'm definitely going to be there on the back bench watching and witnessing that history. Thank you so much, Amina. Um, I think what all three of you have really alluded to is this breach of trust. Um, you guys and the whole like anti arms trade community took it to court and won because everything that we are fighting for is correct and in our law yet the government continued to not only breach our trust but the trust of that judicial contract which is supposed to uphold them um, and that is really why this film is so monumental and so important for us to continue spreading the word um, to make sure that people understand as Amina said these people these lawmakers do not represent us. Um, and yeah, just quickly remind everyone that the film is going public tomorrow at 4 p.m. We're gonna be having a Twitter storm afterwards. So please do join. Engagement is the way that the film will reach more people. So please like, comment, do all those things. Um, okay, so to come to the first question from Anna Manning, um, the question, I think it will be directed towards Katie, and it is, was the decision not to appeal taken, not to appeal on the ground that the court are likely to create or reinforce further dangerous precedent? Mm -hmm. So there was a number of different reasons why we didn't appeal, but concerns about precedent was one of them. Um, I would need to double check, but the success rate of judicial reviews has gone down substantially. I think it could be something like half as many are successful 
as they would have been previously. Um, don't quote me on that half, but it is a really significant number. So they're more difficult to win um, now compared to a couple of years ago. And that is due to the political climate. Um, and I don't think it's very controversial to say that there is a link between the political climate climate and the legal system. Um, and for anyone who was maybe in any of our court cases, um, and I think it was Eva who kind of mentioned how, for instance, like a government lawyer will dismiss NGO or UN work um, in a way that I think is really surprising because when you've spoken to people who work in NGOs or UN investigations, particularly the independent ones, you know how meticulous um, they are. So there's always these kind of um, feedbacks. Uh, but the other thing was that we weren't, we were also knew that the, the likelihood of it being accepted um, to, to for, for an appeal to go ahead was very slim. Um, and that's actually what's ha what has happened. So um, I think it was about a month ago, uh, the court let um, Watna know that the appeal, they weren't given permission to appeal. Um, so that was, yeah, another, another factor um, of, I guess, pausing to see what the, it's quite complicated, I guess, with the, with the approach as well of of doing a legal case where for Kat, we always were doing it with the intention of of being successful um and believing that that was a possibility every time we did it um and wanting to make sure that we were kind of doing right by our supporters as well um with deciding to try to appeal um but it's something that now because there's more legal cases um on arms sales to Israel all of the body of work of our legal cases is kind of the foundation for that. So all of the documents reference all our cases. Um, so we are seeing how it's being used to protect other lives um, in Gaza, for instance. So that's like a really, I think, important way that the case still lives on. Um, that the arguments that were that we made or our, our legal team made on behalf of Yemen can still be used on behalf of other um, citizens, civilians, anybody around the world. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm going to come to two kind of question comments and bring it to a question around campaigning. Um, so the first comment is from Ingrid Wilson. Um, our first mosque in Newport was set up by the Yemeni community in 1942 in a private house by merchant seamen who had decided to settle here. This film made me so angry as to how the cruel reality can be ignored by those in power to make a difference. 100,000 people is two thirds the population of Newport. And the second, um, I think quite linked is a comment from Kathy Conn, um, who says, don't you think that since government can and does ignore the legality of anything they choose, whenever they choose that perhaps another avenue of action needs to be taken, some sort of nonviolent direct action refusing to pay our part of our taxes um, and I just kind of want to bring them together with the question of not just what campaigning needs to be taken now to sustain the momentum for justice for Yemen but also how campaigning really played a part of this legal battle because of course the there's the element of having solicitors who bring the breach of law to the high court but how did the wider campaign against arms trade community and your general campaigning tactics play into the success of that? We'll pass that back to Katie. And then if um, Eva and Amina want to comment on their contributions to the campaigning efforts involved. Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And it's one of the reasons why Kat has kind of direct outreach, um, like more like what you're saying, like nonviolent direct action. Um, we have a research branch with policy work, legal work. So we're quite a small team, but we campaign in many different ways. And, you know, like I would really advocate the importance of um, legal cases because often it's where you can get the government to say the most information and actually make that information public, um, which is was the case with our yeah, that, that was that's for certain 
for certain true on the the legal case we did that they never would have you know parliament wouldn't have allowed them to produce all the information that we were able to see in court um but it's also never enough on its own um and we know and i think yeah i kind of alluded to it in the in the um, film that we are working in a really difficult system that does not want to give us an inch you know war is not illegal um there's nothing to stop countries uh, going to war and our government facilitates that happening. It has a vested interest in there being conflicts taking place constantly. Um, so we're always working in that context. Um, and I think one thing that really struck me that I didn't know before I, I started working on this case and with Kat is that there's a large body of legal work that protects you know different judgments that protects the government's decision making processes from the law so in one sense it would be like as we would agree the separation between um the uh the legal system and the judiciary and parliament um and there's many different reasons why that's a good thing but it, how far that stretch you know sometimes it would seem that the judge would just say oh well that's a matter for government and no more um investigation so I think kind of my concluding thought on that kind of challenge between legal work and campaigning is that don't ever feel like just because you're not a lawyer or you don't have any background that you wouldn't understand it. It's actually not as complicated as they make it out to be. And the complications that they add, a lot of the time, it's just kind of um, like, it's like flowery language on top of something that really holds not that much substance when you kind of break it down. And I think like when Amina, you were saying about art, like art communicates so directly and so specifically. Um, and there's a reason why a big long judgment might initially seem uh, like it's not communicating, any, communicating anything. And that could be the case. Um, so it kind of yeah, connects to why the public campaigning that we did, um, working with journalists, so many different, um, there's at least a dozen cat, uh, um, cat uh, outreach groups in different parts of the country like campaigning in their local areas, like in like, you know, outside a local arms factory, showing that this isn't something that happens at the UN, this is something that happens at our doorstep. I think that is absolutely crucial. And I do think there's more and more awareness building across the UK and across the world, how we're like, not just linked in a kind of a tangential way, but directly, you know, your taxes, um, the company down the road from you, and we all have to take a role in changing the world and, and making it a different place um yeah so uh, i think kathy said there or katie um about refusing to pay parts of taxes and tax justice all of this like there's i think for these kind of problems that are so uh they're so big but they're kind of like the military industrial complex exists everywhere and you kind of think that it's just a it happens in one place and it doesn't um, and we have to think really creatively about how we can how we can tackle it um, and i'll stop there Thank you, Katie. Um, Eva and Amina, do you have anything you want to say about the campaigning effort that went into this court case and campaigning methods going forward? Yeah, I'll um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, and thank you, Katie, for telling us that. I think one of the the main reasons why I became a filmmaker was to use that as a means to. Um, to, to be an activist and to to share a message of um of of truth and um of you know expose injustice and I think on that note of communication we cannot underestimate the power of um online platforms at the moment and how powerful they are to spread messages and coming back to the film to like share subscribe like it's all really important and we are all part of different networks online and the more you advocate for 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 the issue or um to, you know um spread the message um it's going to reach more and more networks and and have a bigger impact so i'm just um giving that giving that note on the on the campaigning side of things that media and um yeah uh communications online as well and you know you could organize a local screening um and yeah spreading the message that way is is a really it's not it's a very valuable way to to contribute to the to the efforts so yeah just um advocating for that one and secondly 
this all starts, you know, there's many le levels of campaigning against the arms trade, but a really integral part of that as well is it's how it is sustained within our education system. So, you know, it's not just like, oh, you know, I'm not trained in legal um, legal jargon and I, I don't feel like I can access this campaign, but you can support um, campaigning against the arms trade through so many different ways. And there's lots of exciting things happening um, that appeals to different people. So I'd say that there's a broad, broad spectrum. Um, and that's okay if I come in. Yeah, um, I don't want to repeat the whole, some, what, what has already been said, but um, just to echo on that as well, definitely uh, being a power has been rooted in activism, um, not because um, I was bored on a Tuesday morning, but because it was it felt like a responsibility. Um, and I actually started writing poetry from witnessing what was happening in Palestine and then I went on to write about the Arab Spring, Syria, and then when the war happened in Yemen, I was probably mute as a poet for a year. So I was trying to understand what do I know? <laughs> like, how much do I know? Um, I think um, the methods of campaigning is, I think one thing I've learned over the years is it starts with attitude. You have to have the attitude that do not normalize this. This is not normal. It's not normal to sell arms and bomb other people like that starts with that fundamental like having that attitude when you wake up every day and saying this is not normal this is not how life should be second of all is actually joining the the resistance and joining the resistance is by having the attitude that you can make a change whether that's small big or huge um and i i definitely think that i wake up every day with that you know, I'm not normalizing this and my children will not normalize this. Um, and yeah, and follow more artists. Uh, don't, you know, underestimate what art can do. It's for a very powerful source. Um, a lot of Yemeni artists have drawn across the walls, especially young men. We never hear from young men. I think young Yemeni men are labeled as the terrorists in this and that every young man wants to go to war and they don't. A lot of young men just want to study and have hopes and dreams. And there was a, a lot of young men that I actually followed during the war who were painting on the streets of men who were just fragile, like stick men, holding a candle. And I just thought it was really powerful just to see that without any words or only political language. That, you know, but yeah. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And of course, um, any of your own campaigning ideas should be brought forward. And we are connected with many, many different organizations, some that are taking um, direct action, some that are going down policy um, routes, some that are doing community organizing, whatever your thing, get in contact with one of our organizations and we can point you in the right direction for sure. Um, Ingrid, to come to your comments, will the film be sent to local MPs? We would love you to do that. Um, we haven't actually built a strategy to do that, but that should happen, absolutely. Um, if you would be up for helping us do that, then please get in contact. Um, and is it okay for us to send it to individuals? Yes, please do. Send to everyone, send it to your your mother, your father, your, your friend, that person down the road that you've only met once, but you see at the bus every now and then. Um, send it everywhere. This link that I'm putting in the chat now um, is where, what you can use to share it with people. Um, and a reminder tomorrow, it's going live to the public at 4pm tomorrow. Um, and we're going to be doing a Twitter storm. So please just tweet a comment about why the UK should oblige by international law, um, or any comments about the film and hashtag don't buy a bomb. And again, please comment on the video on YouTube, you can do that now. Um, you can like it now already, even before it's live, um, which really helps us get the words out there. Um, Andrea, EM, we, we, I think you might have come in a bit late because we did watch the film. Um, so what you'll have to do now is wait till 4 p.m. tomorrow. Um, but you can use that link I just shared to um, watch it then. Um, now coming to John's 
comment, my Sicilian mother as a child was bombed in Geneva, Northern Italy during World War II, destroying her school. I detest war and all it stands for. As a professional ecologist based in Northern Ireland, I can see the indirect impacts on people and ecological systems in terms of impacts on food supplies, wildlife, habitats, water quality and quantity, etc. I'm sad to say many ecological consultants don't talk about the issue. In some cases, they get nice fat contracts from the MOD. Absolutely. And this is something we you know, discuss a lot at Demilitarised Education. When we're talking about our campaigning and we're talking about the, the need to spread this message, and as I've mean, as said, change attitudes, we have to look to the education system and our government puts a lot a lot of money into promoting military ethos in schools and then our universities welcome armed companies in to build research and promote career opportunities within the arms industry so what that does is it conditions many of the british people to see the arms trade as something that is on their side something that you know, is good for our economy without considering all these ecological, economic, and of course, humanitarian um, crimes that it entwines itself in and is by nature. Um, so yes, it's so, so important that in all our ways, we push this conversation out there, help to change attitudes. And those attitudes lead to actions which see policy change and see an end to the free range of such a deadly, deadly industry that is the arms trade. Okay, I'm just gonna come check, there's no more comments. So this Ingrid saying, I just told my 14 year old granddaughter that I'm watching a film about not making bombs. If we don't want them to be dropped on people, she thought that was obvious. <laughs> well, good, get her to send it on to her friends too and see if they think it's obvious. And I think this is true, like most of us are like, Duh. war isn't helpful you know and our arms industry is upholding the political elite and corrupt um and when we talk to more people about that we connect all the dots and begin to see our strength as our community so okay i've just got a few more thank yous to do if anyone's got any more comments um in the meantime while i do these thank yous then put them in the chat and I'll just come back to them at the end. Um, but I am aware that we are nearly at an hour and a half, but we cannot go forward without contributing and giving our thanks to all the amazing people involved in the creation of this film. Um, first of all, the CAT team. We have Katie here representing us, but CAT is a huge team of um, people that work for CAT in their organization and then a massive community beyond that. So thank you to everyone involved in the campaign against arms trade movement. Of course, the Mawatana organization that, you know, Eva so beautifully described as just not just fundamental work for archiving this moment and these war crimes, but also taking such risks to do so. Um, and Radai Almuta Wakel, who is the chairperson for Muatana, who you saw in the film. Wow, her work is just monumental. And you can look up her name from the description of um, the video um, and just read more into how much she does and how much heart and soul she puts into this work. Um, the lawyers. So Debra Minogue and Erin Alcock, um, Andrew Feinstein of Shadow World Investigations for his contrib for contributing his ex expertise, which is world class in anti corruption and scrutiny against the arms trade. Um, the animation was done by Monica Mali Jasak. Um, the sound Michael L Lewin Barker. And apologies to everyone for not having the full sound throughout that. As I said in the chat, even more reason to watch it tomorrow at four in the public viewing because it does just tie it together even more beautifully. But apologies for that not working right now. Um, I guess that's a good point to say as well. This film, this whole project was done on a tiny budget, which 
just really is the the paradox of our whole work in the peace movement and the anti-arms trade movement we're always short of coin and we always put so much passion and heart into everything we do and manage to produce such high quality work with with that with such scarce resources so an extra big ups for the team for making it work like that with with that capacity as well um, then we have the colour, so Jean Hilaire, Juru, and Clara Nico, Nicciotto. Um, and we have camera assistant as well, Iman Dustar, who helped for, um, Eva with the incredible interview filming. And Cindy Sasha, this film was Cindy's idea. Um, Cindy identified the the need for this to be turned into a documentary so that it can really mark this moment and Cindy has been the producer throughout. A bit more about Cindy's work, she's campaign manager with us at Demilitarize Education but she is also the founder of Hear Art, a platform to fund and mentor deaf filmmakers in the UK which actually won the Impact Award at the British Short Film Awards in 2022. She's also been a driving force for the um, climate campaign at Vivian Westwood. Um, and we're really, really blessed that Cindy has brought her expertise and network into the Demilitarized Education Campaign Against Arms Trade Space and used that for the success of the Don't Buy a Bomb film. So eternally grateful for Cindy for having, not just having this idea, but really spearheading the work. So thank you, Cindy. Um, okay, so that is it. We've got thank yous in the chats. Um, and I just want to thank each and every one of you for joining us as well. Um, oh yeah, big ups to Amalia as well. Amalia Adams is here, who's had a massive part in helping us get the word out, spread it to press. We also have Carmen in the chat, who is just well, she's Chief of Operations at DEAD and does so, so much on so many levels and has been involved in editing and, um, you know, refinement of our film process too. So thank you to everyone. And most importantly, thank you to everyone here. Thank you for helping us spread this message. Please do share it on, join our Twitter storm and continue your essential work together we are embarking on for a more peaceful world. Thank you everyone. We will close, stop filming and close the chat off now. I'm gonna end the webinar now.